Welcome back to Heroes of the Faith, a show where we are inspired by the lives of the saints so that we can become saints ourselves. I'm your host, Deacon Isaac Longworth, and I once was talking with a friend of mine who's Christian but not Catholic from a different Protestant denomination, and he asked me a question that I wasn't ready for. He said, are you one of those Catholics that wears chains uh, to symbolize that you're a slave of Mary? And I was like, what are you talking about? I've never even heard of this. And he's like, no, I'm not kidding. There are some Catholics who wear chains to symbolize that they're slaves of Mary. And I was like, I don't know about that. I don't know if I believe you. I'll have to wait till I see it for myself. Well, sure enough, he was right. I ran into some Catholics that wore little chains around uh, their wrists or around their ankles. And when I asked them, why are you wearing chains? They said, well, we made uh, a consecration to Jesus through Mary. And as a symbol of that, we wear this chain to remind ourselves that we are uh, slaves of Jesus through Mary. And I was like, wow, my friend was right. And I originally thought, this is pretty weird. Um, I don't know how I feel about being a slave of Mary. There's something that seems a little off about that. But when I was in my first year of seminary, all of us as seminarians went through a consecration to Jesus through Mary. And I was able to understand more clearly what exactly these people were trying to get at and the truth that is present. And this whole idea of being consecrated to Jesus through Mary comes about because of the saint that I want to share with you today, St. Louis de Montfort. So Louis was born in 1673 in the French town of Montfort, and his family was Catholic. And so Louis was baptized the day after he was born, uh, but that didn't prevent his family, even though they were Catholic, from going through some real struggles early on. Louis was the oldest of 18 children, but nine of his siblings died when they were very young. They never made it to adulthood. And so you can imagine that there was a lot of sorrow in that family. Death was a constant reality as it was in that time period. Many children did not live very long. Louis's father uh, had a really difficult time with this. He also had a really hard time financially providing for his growing family. And so with all of this stress in his life, he had uh, a bit of an anger problem. He had some anger issues and he would lash out at the kids and at his wife. Uh, he would yell, he would scream, he would, he would kind of go into these rages because of all of the stress and frustration in his life that would trigger these angry moods. Now, in contrast to his father, uh, Louis's mom was very patient. Uh, when he was, was yelling, when he was in one of his moods, she was very good at calming him down and making sure that the children learned that they weren't supposed to imitate their father in this way. They weren't supposed to follow after this tendency. Rather, she raised her children to love God and to pray often. Now, little Louis really took to heart what his mom taught him, and he entered wholeheartedly into his prayers, so much so that when he was only five years old, he was already praying the rosary every single day. Now, Louis knew that he needed to pray a lot because he had actually inherited his father's quick temper. Louis had a tendency as well to be very volatile. He could snap when he was angry. He could throw tantrums when he didn't get his way, but he worked very hard at taming his anger. Unlike his father, who just kind of let his rage run wild, Louis worked very hard at uh, imitating the patience of his mother, imitating that virtue, and he worked so hard that he began to actually see victory over his struggles with anger. He was also a very intelligent guy. He was a very smart boy. When he was 12 years old, his parents sent him off to school where he won many awards and many scholarships. And it was here at school that Louis realized in prayer that God was calling him to be a priest. And so obediently, when he had graduated, he said goodbye to his family and he went off to the French city of Paris to study in seminary to become a priest. Now, when he got to the city, he found out that there were two seminaries. One was for seminarians who were from rich families, and it was a little bit nicer. Uh, it had better lodgings, all that good stuff. Uh, and then there was the poor seminary for the children that had come from poor families. And so Louis, because he had come from a poor family, he went to the poor seminary. 
but he did it cheerfully and without complaining. He realized, okay, this is where God is calling me and I am going to really enter in even though the conditions are not very good. I don't know if he knew how bad the conditions were because when he got there, he found out that the food was bad, like really bad. Like, I complain sometimes about the food at my seminary, but it was nothing compared to what Louis encountered. In fact, the food was barely edible, and he got so sick from the food. Either he got food poisoning or it just wrecked his system that he actually had to be hospitalized. So uh, because of Louis, I will never complain about the food that I get anywhere ever again. I've got it pretty lucky compared to him. The seminarians also had to work night shifts to make extra money for the seminary to keep afloat. And these night shifts meant that they would go out into the middle of the night to cart away the bodies of people who had died during the plague that was going on at that time, which is probably one of the worst jobs I can think of. Uh, it was incredibly grisly and it was re honestly really scary because they were doing it at night, just carting these bodies away to be buried. But Louis didn't complain about any of this. He actually entered into this work with a seriousness that began to develop in him because he realized from having to deal with death every day, just how fleeting life on earth was. And it instilled in him this desire to live not for this earth, which is passing away, which is full of death and full of decay, but that he wanted to live for the glory of heaven, for the life that is to come. And so he committed not only to pursuing this for his own life, but to make sure as many people as possible heard about the way to get to heaven through Jesus. Now, while he was in seminary, Louis also served as a librarian. And in his time in the library, he was a bit of a bookworm, which was a perfect job for him. And he began reading every book on Mary that he could find in the library. He was reading all about her growing in his love and his devotion and his knowledge for the Blessed Mother of God. Now, obviously, Louis was a very holy guy. You can probably tell at this point he's been praying the rosary since he was five years old. He's in seminary. He's reading about Mary. But his excessive piety, it bugged some of the other seminarians. You know, every time they were with him, he didn't want to play games with them. He didn't want to hang out. He just wanted to talk about the Lord. He wanted to talk about prayer. And they were like, Louis, come on, man. Why can't you just be normal? Why can't you just talk about normal things for once? Do you have to talk about God all the time? It's a little boring. It's a little annoying. And they actually even complained to the rector of the seminary which you might be wondering, what, like seminarians complaining about the holiness of others? What kind of guys are they? Well, I can personally attest that seminary let me in, so they are perfectly fine with letting in unholy, sinful men. And so this is what Louis was dealing with. Uh, the guys didn't really appreciate him. They were probably jealous of how holy he was, and so instead of trying to become holy themselves, uh, they were putting him down, bullying him, mocking him. Now, gratefully, the, the rector really liked Louis, but he did bring him into his office and cautioned him, look, you need to be a little less intense around the other guys. And so Louis was obedient. And his way of being obedient to this was that he started carrying around a joke book to read to the guys so that he would be considered more fun by them, which I think is hilarious. And his seminarian friends actually found this hilarious as well. They found his personality much funnier than the actual jokes because of this whole scene of this holy seminarian trying to look like he was one of the guys by reading them jokes from a joke book. They thought it was hilarious and eventually he won their friendship in the end. But Louis uh, didn't give up trying to bring his fellow seminarians higher to greater holiness. And he started a prayer group amongst the other guys, which was devoted to to Mary. He reasoned with them that she was the person closest to Jesus. And so for our prayer group, we're going to imitate her in order to follow Jesus better. And so the other seminarians joined in on this and they all began to grow closer to God through the Blessed Mother Mary. Now, after Louis was ordained a priest and became Father Louis, he began to minister to the poor and the abandoned of the city. He worked as a chaplain in hospitals, in poor houses, and even going to prisons. 
And so in all of this work, he was kept very busy. He tended to the physical needs of the people, but he also helped the people with their spiritual needs. Everywhere he went, especially in the prisons, he would hear confession for hours and hours. He would preach to the people about the love of God. He would teach them how to pray, especially how to pray the rosary, how to enter into the life of Jesus through this beautiful prayer of Mary. And rather than eating the better food that was provided for priests in a separate kitchen, he ate the food that the poor were being given in the communal kitchens. Maybe his time in seminary had toughened him up where he realized, look, if I can eat what I ate in seminary, I can eat what they're giving away at the soup kitchens. And he just wanted to be one with the poor. His preaching was so powerful that surrounding churches began to hear about this hospital chaplain who, whose preaching was on fire. And so they invited him to come and give talks at their churches as well. And he would preach with so much power that people flocked to hear him. Sometimes there wasn't even enough room in the church for people to come. He preached about how God wanted them to leave behind their addictions. In his time in the poorhouse and working in prison ministry, he had seen many who were addicted to alcohol, gambling, had lived lives of impurity, were fighting amongst each other, uh, blasphemed God, uh, made fun of holy things. And so he told them, you need to leave these sinful ways behind. And he said, but God wants to help you in this. God doesn't want you to just try and do this on your own. He's given us the gift of of the Blessed Mother. He's given us Mary, our Heavenly Mother, someone who never sinned and who could be our perfect example for what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And so he told the people about how Mary was their loving mother and that there's nothing that she wants to do more than to bring them to Jesus, to her son. And so he told people, look, the easiest way for you to become a saint, the easiest way for you to make it to heaven is to give yourself totally to Mary as if you were her slave. Give yourself over completely to her. And that if you do so, Mary would in turn give you back to Jesus. Now, some people were kind of concerned about this image of slavery. I mean, who wants to be a slave? We want to be free, right? But St. Louis was talking similar to how Paul was talking in Romans chapter 6, verse 22. When Paul writes, now that you have been set free from sin, you have become slaves of God. So Paul is saying slavery to God actually isn't taking away your freedom. It's a mark of your freedom because you've been set free from slavery to sin, slavery to death, slavery to evil. And now you are in the service of God. It's a free gift of yourself that you're giving to God and who is a better master than God? Who is a better master than the Blessed Mother Mary? Both of them love us so much. They want what's best for us. And so it is perfectly fine to offer yourself as a free slave to them than to be trapped in the slavery of addictions and the sins of the world. And so when he explained this to people, they understood it and they began to consecrate and trust themselves to Jesus through Mary. Now, sometimes his preaching missions would take him out of the church and into the streets, either to preach or sometimes to get a little uh, rough and physically oppose the sinful lives of the people. One of my favorite examples of this is one day while he was preaching in a church, the service that was going on was disrupted by a bar nearby where a bunch of drunk guys were laughing and shouting and swearing and carrying on, and they could be heard from inside the church. So Father Louis went out, and he was annoyed. He told them, you know, stop it. Keep it down. People are trying to pray in here. And they just mocked the priest. Oh, we don't need you. Uh, go back inside to your prayers. And uh, they're all just laughing and, and carrying on. And so Father Louis, he still had that anger in him that he had since he was a kid, even though he had grown in patience, sometimes it still burst out. And he just burst into the bar, knocked over their tables, threw their drinks over, and actually started beating up some of the guys who were mocking God. And so he kind of beat some sense into them, and it actually worked. They came back later uh, repentant for what they had done, and they turned their lives over to God and left behind their addiction to drinking. But his harsh methods were always paired 
with the real mercy of Jesus. He had a real knack for bringing people into a powerful experience of the love of God that changed their lives. Once he was preaching in a church and so many people were crying because of the beauty of his words and out of conviction, out of feeling sorry for their sins at his words, that he actually had to stop and tell everyone to quiet down because the church was so full of sobbing and cries from the people that no one could hear him preaching anymore. And so he kind of had to call a timeout, let everyone get the tears out of their system before he continued preaching. But people flocked to confession to him after hearing his sermons. They were so convicted by his words that they wanted to receive forgiveness from God. And Father Louis was so gentle and so kind in the confessional that they felt like they could tell him anything, that they could really unburden themselves before the Lord. Now, obviously, the devil hated Father Louis. He hated this holy priest because Father Louis was stealing so many souls from the devil and bringing them into the kingdom of God that the devil decided, I need to take this guy out somehow. And so he would actually physically attack Father Louis during the day. People once saw Father Louis being dragged across the ground by an invisible force because the devil was attacking him. Another time they heard this this uproar coming from upstairs, banging and chairs being thrown around as if there was a bar brawl breaking out. But Father Louis was up there all by himself fighting with demons. And they heard uh, in the midst of all the banging, Father Louis saying to the demons, I laugh at you. I laugh at you because my strength and my courage will never fail as long as I have Jesus and Mary with me. Isn't that awesome that Father Louis, even though he's being attacked by demonic forces, he is able to just laugh at them because he knows that Jesus and Mary at his side are far more powerful than any attack from hell could be. Frustrated that these attacks didn't work at stopping Father Louis, the devil devised even more inventive ways to get rid of this priest and to stop his ministry. So he tempted some of Father Louis's brother priests to oppose him. Some of these priests didn't like him because they thought that he was too soft. He was too soft on sinful people. He kept telling them about God's mercy. He encouraged them to go to Holy Communion. And they thought, well, he shouldn't be telling them to go to Holy Communion all the time. That's just for perfect people. And these people who Father Louis is talking to, they are not perfect. Not perfect like us, right? They were full of pride and they didn't like that he was spending time with the poor and the sinners to convert them. They thought that was unbecoming of a priest, that he should be distant, that he should be separate from those lowly sinners outside the church. And some of the priests were just jealous. The people were talking about how holy and how good Father Louis was and they loved him, they loved his preaching. And so rather than trying to change their own lives, Like the seminarians in seminary with him, they just wanted to get rid of him. They wanted to bring him down to their level. And so as a result of all of these different priests scheming in opposition to him, Father Louis was removed from his job as chaplain at the hospital. And this got him thinking, what am I going to do now? Like, God, what are you saying to me in this? What are you trying to teach me through this resistance from these fellow priests who should have my back. And he thought to himself, well, maybe I'm called to leave France, to just leave this country behind me. I'll go on a missionary trip to Canada, where the French had a colony there to work as a missionary there. But he actually went and talked with a pope about this. He talked with the pope, and the pope said to him, Father Louis, you have in France a field that is large enough for the exercise of your zeal. Do not leave it. Always work in perfect submission to the bishops in whose dioceses you are called to preach. And in this way, God will bless your work. So the Pope said, Father Louis, I don't think you're called to leave France. I think that France has enough people in it that God wants to win for himself through your preaching. So go be obedient to the bishops, keep preaching here in France and do the work of God. And Father Louis was obedient. He supported the Pope. He was loyal to him. And so he went back to preaching missions all over France. And he had a very unique way 
of doing it. Every place he went was a little bit different. He spoke to what the needs of the people were wherever he went. One mission, Father Louis didn't even preach. All he did was he walked into the church. He set up a crucifix at the front, this cross with this image of Jesus crucified on it. And he just stared at the crucifix with so much love that the people were moved just by seeing him look at a crucifix. And then what he did is he went around to all the people in the church, bringing a smaller crucifix, getting them to look at it. And they burst into tears at seeing this image of Jesus who had been crucified, killed for their sins so that they could be forgiven. And then he just heard confessions for hours and like converted the whole town. So he loved doing these inventive things. He once built a giant hill of Calvary. So he built this hill with three crosses on it, uh, Jesus in the middle and the two thieves on either side. And he built this outdoor rosary path around the hill so that people could pray the rosary while looking at the cross and meditating upon Jesus. And he had this whole idea for this to be a place where people could come to encounter the love of God. But the day before his Calvary Hill was supposed to be blessed and commissioned, those jealous priests convinced the bishop of that area to stop Father Louis's project. And eventually, they arranged for the whole site to be destroyed. And Father Louis was heartbroken. He had spent so much time, so much money, so much effort into getting this place built, only to have it be destroyed the day before it was to be used. The priest went and told rumors about Father Louis. They put political pressure on the bishop to ban him from doing missions in the diocese. And Father Louis was so frustrated by their scheming. His anger issues that he had from his dad were just bubbling below the surface. And he was so tempted to just freak out on these priests who were acting in opposition to the work of God. But rather than doing that, he remembered to imitate the patience, not only of his earthly mother, but of his heavenly mother, who he had consecrated himself to. And he forgave them and he returned to the peace of Jesus, asking Mary for help in being patient like she was. And so he was obedient to the unfair treatment that he got from the bishops, just like the Pope had told him to. And just like the Pope had told him to, despite the scheming of the priests and uh, the, the bishops who were treating him so unfairly, the work of Father Louis throughout France continued to flourish. Many thousands of people came to hear him preach. And when he wasn't traveling across France, preaching and hearing confessions, he was working on writing a book on Mary. He called the book True Devotion to Mary. And this book uh, was all about the beauty of Mary. He wrote about uh, how close she was to Jesus, her importance in God's plan of saving us, how God had chosen Mary to be the way that Jesus was introduced into our world as a human. And he wrote about how we can consecrate ourselves to her so that we can become saints. But he had this this prophetic insight into what this book would go through after his death. And Father Louis wrote down about his own book. He said, I clearly foresee raging beasts, symbolizing demons. And he says, these raging beasts shall come in fury to tear with their diabolical teeth this little writing, or at least cover it up in the darkness and silence of a coffer so that it may not appear. Now, that seems like a really weird thing to say about his book, that demons are going to try and destroy it, or at the very least, they're going to cover it up in darkness in a little box so that it may not appear. What exactly is Father Louis getting at here? Well, don't worry, the mystery of the book will be explained soon. I'll come right back to that. But after he wrote this book, Father Louis became very sick with at first something that seemed like a common cold, but quickly it got worse and worse. It developed into into pleurisy, into pain in his chest. He had difficulty breathing, and then he began running a really high fever. And yet despite his sickness, he continued to preach the mission that he was running. He had such a love for the people that he didn't want to let his sickness get in the way of them hearing about God. Even though he was so weak 
that when he was preaching, people thought he was going to faint while he was up the pulpit. And this indeed would be his last sermon because right afterwards, he was so weak where he was forced to be put in bed, unable to walk. And he lay there in great pain, struggling with his illness. And in one hand, he held a crucifix. And in the other hand, he held a little statue of Mary. The two great loves of his life. And Father Louis died of his illness when he was only 43 years old. Now, what about that book that I told you I would tell you about? Well, after his death... A priest took the book that Louis had written and planned to submit it for publishing, but he didn't get around to it. And he actually passed it on to his successor, to the next guy and said, you know what? This is a book I was hoping to publish. You publish it. And then this next priest, he delayed as well. And this kept happening until eventually France went through the French Revolution which was a time of great danger for the Catholic Church. Uh, The revolutionaries were destroying anything Catholic that they could get their hands on. And so the book was buried, along with a bunch of other Catholic books, in a box for safety underground. And after the revolution, this box was retrieved. But by that point, no one really knew what books were in it. And so all of them were just brought to a monastery to be kept in storage, where it was lost, left, and forgotten. Until 126 years later, a priest was going through some of these old books in the monastery, uh, trying to find something to write a homily on, and he found this manuscript called True Devotion to Mary by Father Louis de Montfort. And so eventually it was published in 1843, 126 years after St. Louis wrote it. So this was true to his prophetic insight that he received, that the demons hated this book so much that they were able to cover it up in a box under darkness for a long time so that it would not appear. But Jesus and Mary had the final victory in allowing this book to be brought to the light. And this book, True Devotion to Mary, is still available to us today. I read it the first time I consecrated myself to Mary in that first year of seminary that I was talking about at the beginning of the show. And this book is all about how we can give ourselves all that we are, all that we have, everything that we own to Mary and Jesus as a slave. Again, properly understood what being a slave of Mary means. St. Louis de Montfort says that the surest, easiest, shortest, and most perfect way to become a saint is through Mary. And he would know he's a saint. So I'm going to take his advice and I hope you do too. And for the prayer today, I want to lead you in a short form of consecration to Mary that St. Louis de Montfort wrote himself. And I encourage you to pray along with this. Of course, this isn't the fullness of the 33-day consecration that he set out in his book, but it is something that we can pray right now to entrust ourselves to Mary just like he did so that we can become saints like he did. So pray with me in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I, a faithless sinner, renew and ratify today in your hands the vows of my baptism. And I renounce forever Satan, his works, his pomps, And I give myself entirely to Jesus Christ, the incarnate wisdom, to carry my cross after him all the days of my life and to be more faithful to him than I have ever been before. In the presence of all the heavenly court, I choose you this day, Mary, for my mother and mistress. I deliver and consecrate to you as your slave my body my soul, my goods, both interior and exterior, and even the value of all my good actions, past, present, and future, leaving to you the entire and full right of disposing of me and all that belongs to me, without exception, according to your good pleasure, for the greater glory of God in time and in eternity. Amen. St. Louis de Montfort, pray for us. And Blessed Mother Mary, help us become saints. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.